On the last video, I showed you how I created this radio telescope. Now it's time to find out if we can pick up any signals. In the first video, I showed you how I designed this radio telescope antenna and connected it to the Raspberry Pi. I discussed the fact that we're looking to pick up signals from the hydrogen line in the Milky Way galaxy. The hydrogen line is radiation at the 21 centimeter length, which is 1.42 megahertz. Hi, editing Kevin here. Recording Kevin over there just said that the hydrogen line was at 1.42 megahertz. It's actually at 1.42 gigahertz. This is the radiation that's given off by neutral hydrogen. So this is a great way to map the, where hydrogen is in the galaxy. If you haven't seen that video yet, I encourage you to go back and watch that one before continuing with this one. In order to process the signals that we receive from the antenna, we need to have a digital signal processor which is a software program that's able to break down the signal we receive into the various bandwidths and let us know the power that is being transmitted at each particular bandwidth. One of the most popular of these is called SDR Sharp. It's used quite widely in the radio astronomy community and it can be downloaded for free. For this project, however, I chose to go with a software suite called Virgo because it had a lot of the functionality that I wanted to use. It's an open source project and can be downloaded from a link in the description below. To run the software, you're going to need a platform. It can be any type of computer, generally a laptop for portability, or a tablet, even a phone. But for my project, I chose to go with a Raspberry Pi, simply for its portability, and also because it has the ability to run Python natively and Virgo is written in the Python programming language. I've placed the Raspberry Pi into this case, which also has a screen on it. I've added a uh, keyboard to it, and it's powered by this 110 volt portable battery. It's connected to the telescope via the SDR by a standard USB cable. I earlier had it in a much smaller case but unfortunately, because of the amount of processing it has to do, it was overheating every time I tried to take a reading, so I had to move it to this larger case that includes a fan. Before you take a reading, when you first set up the telescope, you need to calibrate the telescope. The air is full of radio waves at all frequencies, and that forms a type of background noise. We want to make sure we get a level reading of that background noise so that we can subtract it from our signal when we're trying to read the hydrogen line. This will allow us to pick out the hydrogen line signal from any other signal. There are two different ways to calibrate a radio telescope. One is called a hot calibration. In that type of calibration, you point the antenna at the ground and take a reading. We can't do that with this particular software, but that is a helpful way of filtering out the heat radiation that comes from the Earth. The other type of calibration is a cold calibration. In order to do that, you have to point the telescope at an area of the sky that is pointing away from the plane of the Milky Way. This allows you to take a reading in an area where you know that there is no hydrogen. To do that, I'm going to aim the telescope in an area that I know has no hydrogen. And then tell the computer to take a reading. Once the cold calibration is completed, we save that file under the name calibration data so that when we take an actual reading, we're able to compare it to that and filter out the noise. Now that we have our cold calibration in place, it's time to actually take a reading of the Milky Way galaxy. 
For this, you'll need to use a phone astronomy app or an astronomy map to determine the right ascension and declination of an area of the Milky Way galaxy that you want to read. And I've already done that, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the telescope in that direction, aligning it using the, cal the uh, compass that is at the bottom of the telescope, and then use the protractor to set it to the precise angle. Now, this is not exactly a precision instrument. This will take a reading of an area of the sky that's about 18 degrees wide. So we don't have to be incredibly precise in pointing it because we're going to be taking a picture of a large part of the sky regardless of how carefully we set it. Once the telescope is pointed in the same direction, we simply run another reading and allow it to tell us what radio waves are coming from that part of the sky. When taking a reading, we're going to want to do about a five minute integration. This allows it to average the signal over a long period of time. Our calibration allows us to account for kind of the background level, but there are always sudden unexpected spikes of radio signals from time to time that can't be accounted for by the calibration. Averaging over a long period of time allows us to filter out that static. Once you've done your reading and gotten your results, you can plot that reading in order to get a readout. Virgo has automatic plotting capabilities built in, and this is one of the plots that it creates. It has five different graphs, and then at the top it tells you the date and time of the reading, and this is one that I took last October um, around 7.54 in the evening, and it tells us the target in right ascension and declination, and I was pointed at the constellation Vulpecula at the time. All of this information is available to Virgo because it reads the system time and date from the Raspberry Pi and records that along with the data file. And I also tell it the target of my reading so that that is preserved along with the data as well and can be retrieved at a later date. The first and second graphs are the most important for our purposes, so I'm going to focus on those two. These show the average spectrum and the calibrated spectrum. We are looking for emissions from neutral hydrogen, which is at 1.42 gigahertz. And so the red dashed line that you see in the middle is focused on that frequency. It also shows the spectrum from about 1.5 megahertz prior to the hydrogen line up to 1.5 megahertz higher than the hydrogen line. The graph on the left is the average spectrum, and you can see that there is indeed a point just to the left of the hydrogen line. That peak becomes much more obvious when we calibrate the data using the cold reading that we took beforehand. This is what you see on the right-hand side. This allows the readings around the hydrogen line to stand out. This allows us to see that we have a reading that spans from 1420 megahertz up to about 1421 megahertz. You may be wondering why we have a reading that spans one megahertz. Since we're looking for the hydrogen line, shouldn't our entire reading be at 1.42 gigahertz? What you need to remember is that 1.42 gigahertz is the emitted frequency of the hydrogen line. But just as with any electromagnetic radiation, we have to deal with a redshift or blue shift, depending on whether the object emitting the radiation is moving toward us or away from us. If we read a frequency that is lower, that means the radio waves have been redshifted, and therefore the object is moving away from us. If the frequency is higher, that means it's blue shifted and the object is moving toward us. What you need to remember, however, is that all movement is relative. The Earth is moving and the hydrogen that we are reading is moving. And so what we get a readout in the graph is the relative velocity between the two. Both are moving, 
But if one is moving faster or slower than the Earth, that's going to affect the reading. In looking at this particular reading, we can see that there is a lot of hydrogen that is to the left of the line, meaning that hydrogen is moving faster than the Earth. Given the direction of our reading, the hydrogen in this section of our graph is likely coming from the Sagittarius arm. The Sagittarius arm is closer to the galactic center than the Earth is, so everything in that area is moving faster than the Earth. The small bump that you see to the right of the line is an area of hydrogen that is moving slower. This more than likely comes from the Perseus arm, which is farther away from the galactic center than the Earth is, and therefore is orbiting more slowly. The scale at the top of the graph allows you to determine the relative speed of the hydrogen at any point on the graph. To understand our reading, we also need to wrap our heads around one more concept. You notice that both of the spectrums are indicated to be in VLSR, which is the local standard of rest velocity. Our readings are taken from Earth, but the Earth is moving in several different directions at the same time. This can cause distortions in our readings. Let me show you what I mean. One source of motion is the Earth's rotation. Let's imagine that we're taking a reading of an object that is to the right in this view. An observer from the part of the Earth that is moving perpendicular to this object is not going to see any change. However, if you are on the part of the Earth that is moving toward the object, the object will appear to be going slower. If you're on the part of the Earth moving away from the object, it will appear to be moving faster. The Earth rotates at about half a kilometer a second at the equator and slower as you move towards the pole, but it's still worth noting that this does add some speed to the reading. A more substantial contribution to the speed, however, is made by the Earth's orbital motion around the Sun. If we once again imagine that we are viewing an object off to the right, the object will appear slower when the Earth is moving toward it, exhibit no change when the Earth is moving perpendicular, and show additional speed when the Earth is moving away from it. Because the Earth orbits the Sun at roughly 30 kilometers per second, this can add substantial changes to the reading. In addition, we have to account for the fact that the Sun itself is moving through the galaxy slightly faster than the material in the surrounding area. The local standard of rest velocity is an average of the motion of all stars within 100 parsecs of the Sun. Because the Virgo software knows the time of year and our location, it is able to take into account all the motion imparted by the Earth's rotation and orbit and the Sun's movement. This transforms the reading into the reference frame of the local standard of rest velocity, which shows us the speed of the object we are measuring relative to our local standard of rest. Well, that's it for our readings today. I hope you've enjoyed our first look into radio astronomy, and I hope that perhaps this has inspired you to try to create your own radio telescope. If you do, or if you have any questions about radio astronomy, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I'll see you on the next edition of Photonic. On each episode of Photonic, I try to introduce you to different organizations that serve as resources for those in the astronomical community. For this episode, I want to introduce you to the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers. The Society is a wonderful resource for learning about astronomy, and its online community is a great way to get answers to questions that you may have as you're trying to build your own radio telescope. They were very helpful for me, and I encourage you, if you're going to be in radio astronomy, to join and participate in the online discussions.